Okay, uh, we're still on this subject of equilibrium and stability in plasmas, which is more or less what uh, is really kind of the fun part, particularly the stability <coughs> in plasmas. And so, uh, well, anyway, so I want to just remind you that that's what we're trying to talk about, equilibrium and stability. Um, now, in this regard, before we get into stability, uh, a sort of general thing that we need to realize about plasmas is that they are highly conducting media and that, in fact, uh, if you had a regular you know, superconductor, you know that if you had any magnetic flux embedded in that superconductor, that if in a wire, say, and you moved the wire, you would expect the magnetic flux to stay in the wire and move with it. And if a plasma is a very good electrical conductor, it then shouldn't surprise us that, in fact, magnetic flux embedded in a highly conducting plasma will more or less stay there. So what I want to do is to remind you that we kind of quickly, at the last of last time, wrote down that, uh, well, this so-called frozen flux theorem, um, which was, and I want to illustrate and talk about that a little bit and then add resistivity and show you then something else happens. And that frozen flux theorem was written as uh, d by dt of the integral, and maybe I should uh, say at constant uh, total mass, or constant, let me say, number of particles, let me do it that way, times ds uh, dot b is equal to zero. So the idea is that if we have uh, a bunch of field lines here and, and a plasma so these are a bunch of field lines B, and we've got plasma embedded in them, and let me just put it between, let us say, those two field lines. Then the idea of the frozen flux theorem is that if I was somehow able to move this field line up to here, that in fact the plasma would also move on, on up to there as well. That is to say, you know, if I had a certain number of particles between these two magnetic field lines, or really in a kind of bundle of flux, at a certain number of particles, that in fact those particles would just spread out and still encompass the same number of magnetic field lines. So what this means is then, uh, in the limit of infinite plasma conductivity, that is to say, the plasma is more or less of a superconductor, uh, or resistivity goes to zero. Uh, the plasma moves with the magnetic field lines. Uh, and we should say, and vice versa, which is to say that the uh, B field moves with the plasma. Same number of flux lines per number of particles is the basic idea. Now, uh, the next thing we want to address is to say, well, okay, that's fine if I had an infinitely electrically conducting plasma. What about if I had a more realistic situation uh, as we do in a plasma usually, with a little bit of finite electrical um, conductivity or, or resistivity. And so what we want to do is add resistivity to this picture and to see what we think that does to the, to the business. So let's say add resistivity. And what we ended up doing, let's recall, is we used Ohm's law. Uh, and so what our Ohm's law now is, is that we have uh, J is equal to electrical conductivity um, times the electric field plus V cross B. And we also used Faraday's induction law, or Faraday's law, from Maxwell's equation, equations. And that is, of course, that which we wrote in the form of dB dt is equal to minus the curl of E. So what we now want to do is to solve Ohm's law for the electric field. <coughs> 
and stick it into there. And so if we solve Ohm's law for the electric field, what we find is that E is equal to minus V cross B. And that from before was the part that caused the plasma to convect with the magnetic field. But then we have this additional term due to the electrical conductivity, which will be plus J over sigma. But we often now will write this as, let's say, eta times J, eta being the electrical resistivity, of course. So um, now, so we substitute then this, this solution or <coughs> representation of the electric field from Ohm's law into Faraday's induction law. And doing that, what we find is that we have dB dt is equal to, and now minus curl of E, uh, the first term gives us the curl of uh, V cross B. And then the other term gives us uh, minus del cross uh, eta over mu naught of del cross B. Now, uh, there's a you know there's a little bit of complication in the operators here, and so for simplicity, what we will do to illustrate things is we'll assume eta is equal to constant in space, and with that, then we can take the eta over mu naught outside of the um, spatial derivative operators, and Another thing we have to take into consideration or, or do is to realize that the curl of the curl of B, if you just look up in vector tables like in the NRL uh, formulary, is in fact uh, minus del squared B for the Laplacian. And then there's another term which is equal to minus the gradient of del dot B. However, um, we have, of course, a uh, solenoidal field. We have a, sorry, well, anyway, we have no monopoles, so divergence B is equal to zero. So putting um, all of this together, what we find is that the magnetic field evolution with a little bit of resistivity is then given by the curl of V cross B. And then minus minus becomes plus. So this becomes plus eta over mu naught times del squared b. Now we can kind of identify the terms. Namely, this first term is the term we dealt with in getting this frozen flux theorem. <laughs> Namely, what it says is it's the movement of the magnetic field uh, with the plasma flow velocity V. Okay. So this says I convect the, and it's a little complicated because of the curl here, but anyway, I convect the magnetic field along with the plasma because the, the, in this term I have effectively infinite conductivity and, and therefore the field lines are frozen into the plasma electrically. What about the second term? Well, if we kind of remember, you know, our, our density equation, we had uh, like uh, dn dt, this is sort of a, let's just say a side comment over here, uh, plus del dot gamma is equal to zero, and if we used fixed diffusion law, gamma is equal to minus uh, d grad n, it's supposed to be a d, kind of hard to see, then this equation became dn dt minus d d squared n by dx squared equals zero. So that's a diffusion equation, you know, mass diffusion equation. And if you look at the structure of this, it's a vector field, B, which is being operated on. But frankly, it's just a diffusion operator that happens, okay, that, that is present here. So what this last term is, is that, well, in fact, there is some diffusion of the magnetic field relative to just moving with the plasma because of the finite resistivity. So this is what's often called resistive 
diffusion of B uh, relative to, to V. That is to say, some magnetic flux lines leak out of a certain number of particles in the plasma because of the fact that I have a um, really a finite electrical uh, resistivity in the plasma. So what we often like to refer to this then as is this is then a diffusion coefficient uh, and so what we like to say is that the diffusion coefficient of the magnetic field is equal to eta over mu naught and that's the diffusion of the magnetic field relative to a not quite perfect electrical conductor. Now, uh, if I had that term alone, then we know how to solve these diffusion equations, and we know that then this would lead to a magnetic field which would sort of, you know, be some e to the minus t over tau eta in some cylindrical model or something like that, and we would get that the diffusion of the magnetic field out of, let's say, a cylinder of plasma of radius L, let's call it L sub R here for a moment, I'll sketch in a moment. Uh, we had this Bessel function business about uh, when we dealt with um, diffusion out of cylinders, and it's just a different diffusion equation here. It's diffusion of magnetic flux instead of diffusion of um, plasma particles or uh, heat or something like that. And I made too small a cylinder here, but I'm trying to say that the, the sort of L sub R would be sort of the radius of the cylinder. Okay. Um, so the idea is this is called the magnetic diffusion, diffusion rate, and this is sometimes called the skin diffusion time. And it is that if I set up some magnetic field in a plasma with finite resistivity, this is the rate or time scale of the ultimate lowest order eigenmode, the rate at which that eigenmode diffuses away. Okay? In typical laboratory plasmas like some of the tokamaks on campus, this will be like 10 seconds or something because the plasmas at a kilovolt turn out to be as good a conductor as copper, uh, actually, and so they hold the flux pretty well, it turns out. Now, there's another... So, so this is magnetic diffusion... So magnetic fields are pretty well frozen into plasma, as it turns out. Um, there's another aspect. Uh, if I now imagine going to the edge of, of some cylindrical plasma and I impose an oscillating magnetic field or something like that, I can ask how far will that magnetic field permeate into an almost superconductor type plasma or a fairly highly conducting plasma. Um, and so let's ask about something. I won't go through this in detail, but I just want to kind of mention these things. Um, anyway, so let's ask for what's called the resistive skin depth uh, for a B uh, like e to the minus i omega t uh, imposed at the edge. And now, to give you an idea how you check these things on, let me call them back of the envelope type calculations, what you can do is say, well, look, uh, I'll just kind of scale. I won't worry about this movement of B relative to V. That's in there, and it's important. But what I care about is how much diffusion there is relative to that. And so what I can do is I can say that I will have a delta B over a delta T that is of order, and then it's order eta <coughs> over mu naught times, and then there will be a delta B but that's a del squared, so I'll have to put some scale length squared downstairs. So all I'm doing is scaling this diffusion equation. And if I do this, I can see that the scale length of the gradient of the diffusion, I, I, well, uh, I can estimate that scaling of that diffusion length. Namely, um, you just uh, work this back through, and what you find is that delta x is of the order of the square root, okay, of eta over mu naught times delta t. And the delta t, um, 
that's relevant okay, becomes approximately 1 over the frequency if I have an oscillating wave. And so out of this, and you can do this up better in good algebra, let's say, is you end up with a uh, skin depth for how far does an oscillating electromagnetic field penetrate into a slightly resistive plasma, or frankly, this could be a copper bar at this point. Uh, the answer is it's sort of eta over mu naught omega, although often eta is written as conductivity, and so the more standard form of this is omega mu naught electrical conductivity. And so this is known as the uh, resistive skin depth. Again, it's how far does a wave penetrate into a slightly resistive uh, plasma. But notice that if I applied an electromagnetic field to the edge of a fairly conducting plasma, in fact, what I would have is mostly the plasma just shakes with the magnetic field because it's more or less conducting. On the other hand, there, there's a slight oozing of the magnetic field relative to the, um, uh, relative to the plasma. Now, uh, also comes with this uh, resistivity, sorry, yeah, electrical resistivity, is a joule heating or ohmic dissipation in the plasma because, you know, I'll get some E dot J and so forth. But I, I really will come back to that when we talk about tokamaks in which you lay in magnetic flux from the outside. You soak it in all the time, and it's dissipated through joule heating. But that's kind of uh, for later. Okay, now, so this we kind of have to understand uh, about a plasma. But next, I, I then want to go on to the subject of um, plasma instabilities. And so let's kind of uh, start discussing that. And the kind of comment is this is going to be relaxation of a plasma via instabilities. And I briefly mentioned a little bit of this last time. Um, in a certain sense, if we just have a plasma... Um, Uh, we just have a, a plasma, the magnetized plasma, and it, you know, it'll collisionally scatter out and slowly diffuse out. But if we create a plasma in a sort of funny ways, as we'll talk about in a little bit, the plasma thinks that it gets impatient and gets across magnetic fields by virtue of collective instabilities. Now, uh, so I'm going to try to talk about those instabilities. But before we talk about the instabilities, we'd like to talk about how, in fact, um, the kind of general constraints on how, uh, how a plasma could uh, relax. And for this, we imagine the plasma is collisionless because we're interested in processes by which the plasma can move across magnetic fields relatively rapidly compared to collisions, hence the collisions are unimportant on that time scale. So for collisionless plasmas, um, there is no H theorem. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, in collisional situations, you have the so-called Boltzmann H theorem, or entropy production, or however you want to rate it. And the plasma, that H theorem in a collisional gas in this room, or if you had a collisional plasma, um, would drive the plasma towards a thermodynamic equilibrium with a Maxwellian distribution, and so forth. And equilibrium statistical mechanics uh, whether quantum mechanical or non-quantum mechanical, is all based on that. The problem is, in a plasma, we don't have an H theorem, in general, which tells us where the plasma is trying to go. Uh, so, it's, so the problem is, we can't tell what relaxed state the plasma is trying to go to. Okay? That is to say, it's not clear it's like a Maxwellian or exactly what. So the way to say it is it's not clear what the relaxed state it's trying to get to is. By the way, maybe I should say um, 
the reason why we might think it's out of thermodynamic equilibrium is because we're often trying to confine hot plasmas away from walls where there are plasma density gradients or pressure gradients. And that seems like it ought to be some sense of non-equilibrium that at least collisions would try to relax. And the question is, what about <clears throat> also, uh, what about collective processes? Um, this is sort of beyond this course, but let me just say that if you go into a collisionless plasma, uh, it turns out uh, that actually either you, you can show that either an entropy functional integral d cubed v f log f uh, or even the integral d cubed v of some generalized entropy functional g of f uh, is conserved in a collisionless plasma. So it's a constant of the motion, actually. Uh, and so the basic idea there is that entropy, as usually defined, is not a very useful uh, concept. Um, but you can show, uh, using that sort of logic, that uh, if the distribution function and we're going into kinetic theory later, so I won't really dwell upon this, but anyway, is only a function of energy and that the distribution is a monotonically decreasing function of energy, of which a Maxwellian is one class, uh, then the plasma is stable. But that doesn't really <laughs> uh, help us much uh, because it says uh, any distribution function which is a monotonically decreasing function of the energy is okay, and there's um, a lot of those, let's just say. So the problem then is that in a plasma you can't really define entropy, you can't define an H theorem, you can't define a free energy. And so what can you do? Well, what you end up doing is saying, okay, I'll just perturb the plasma and I'll figure out that it does some oscillation that grows, and then I'll work at, worry about the linear growth of that oscillation and then the nonlinear growth of it. Now, even though you cannot precisely define a sense of free energy, you can kind of qualitatively um, do it. And again, this is, uh, so let's call this sense of free energy that may cause instabilities. Uh, And those would be from various possible sources in the plasma, uh, in, let's just say, a plasma. And there's basically um, three different types. One is grad N, grad T, spatial gradients of temperature, density, uh, etc. And this is known as expansion-free energy because if, if the plasma removes the density or temperature gradient, it expands and flattens out, right? So this is called expansion-free energy. Uh, and these are going to be, and this is what I'm going to talk about in a moment, uh, the so-called Rayleigh-Taylor uh, uh, type instabilities, uh, in a fluid at least. The second thing that can give us certain types of instabilities are sort of flow, flows or streaming in the plasma. And this would be that, you know, my plasma has a flow velocity or maybe a heat flow velocity or et cetera. And we'll get into so-called two-stream instabilities and, and various things like that. And then finally, so these are all describable in a fluid way. Finally, you end up with some velocity space instabilities. Uh, and these would be like uh, maybe we have different perpendicular temperatures compared to parallel temperatures uh, in direction of a magnetic field. And uh, or maybe, you remember in a mirror machine, we have various uh, loss cone type instability, uh, loss cones where half of velocity space is empty. And so you can imagine a plasma instability would like to fill that in, basically, like to put some particles there. So those are the general uh, sense. Now, before I get on to an instability calculation, I need to kind of tell you this kind of schema of um, 
of how you go about calculating instabilities and figuring out what, what happens. So let's call this the general scheme of uh, instability slash plasma relaxation calculations. Now, the first comment is that we had best make sure that the plasma is, in fact, in equilibrium first. So first is, is calculate the equilibrium situation. And for this, of course, what we mean is that the figure out, you know, all the variables, the magnetic field structure and so forth, in which the net force at each position in the fluid plasma uh, is, in fact, zero. Then what you do is you say, okay, now let me suppose a, a small perturbation on the plasma. And then the comment is that this will lead to, um, this is just like our wave analysis. You know, we imposed a small perturbation. On the other hand, what we now look for is that it grows linearly. So we try to find those cases for which the imaginary part of the frequency is greater than zero. And uh, we, we assume, I mean, that's the sort of sense of these instability calculations, that it does so by tapping the free energy. So the idea is I have some expansion free energy and perhaps, or one of those other sources of free energy, and if I put a wave or oscillation in there, it is somehow able to get at that source of free energy and have the wave grow at the expense of that free energy. Uh, let's just remember that e to the minus i omega t, if I make omega is equal to uh, omega real plus i omega i, e to the minus i omega t, uh, then just becomes e to the minus i omega real t, and then plus omega i t. So if omega i, the imaginary part of omega, is greater than zero for some wave in a plasma, it in fact means that that mode is growing in time, linearly growing in time. Now, can it grow forever? Well, no, usually we did some linearization, right? We it neglected a whole bunch of second and third and so, so forth uh, order terms. And so you presume, and this is really hard work to calculate, but you presume that there's then some nonlinear saturation. And it turns out that can come in more or less two different ways. Um, one is a single, uh, well, a single coherent mode. You know, that one, you could sap up all the energy into one mode. Or more often what happens uh, is you get plasma turbulence on a, on a sort of small scale. And then once you get that, then you typically get, this leads to anomalous transport in the plasma. And it means anomalous because it's larger than, that's the only reason why we would care, larger than the Coulomb collision uh, induced transport. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about now is a particular instability, and it's one that's very familiar from, you know, real life experiences, and it's called the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, and I'll show you how we go through at least the linear version of that. So, um, and this mo mode, the so-called Rayleigh-Taylor instability, is very analogous, uh, or Rayleigh, got to be the other way around, Rayleigh, uh, Taylor instability. It's very analogous to, uh, well, it's a fluid instability, but it's very analogous to a plasma instability. And the basic, the most fundamental, okay, way that this can be illustrated is let us imagine we had a, a tank of water, okay, and so we'll uh, put in a tank of, of water here and fill it up to some level. And now I will put on top of this water uh, some oil or other immiscible liquid. Uh, 
and I'll fill it up with another liquid on top. Uh, now, the basic question is, what's going to happen? Now, physically, if the liquid that I put on top, and I, I'm, I, I can't tell you how I keep the surface from jiggling, but that's uh, incidental. I, I'm, I'm somehow able to perfectly prepare experiments here. Uh, if the liquid on top is lightweight compared to the liquid on the bottom, then we know it'll just sit there. Okay? But if the liquid on top is heavyweight compared to the liquid on the bottom, we know that it's going to fall down, basically. And that falling down process is it sort of leaks through in little wiggles, and that is called the Rayleigh-Taylor instability that removes that. So uh, now uh, what I want to do is, is just show you how that process gets described mathematically, and then we'll show how this process is, in fact, very analogous to what happens in a plasma. Uh, so if you imagine that you had a gravitational force, of course, gravity is the key aspect here, right? It tells me which way is up and down. So I'm going to have a gravitational force in this direction, and I'm also going to have a gravitational potential, which I will define as up in this direction. Capital G will be that gravitational potential. So the Rayleigh-Taylor instability is, uh, this is the classic, um, let's call it expansion instability of a heavy fluid over a light fluid. And over, of course, direction is determined by gravity. Gravity. What about collisions in this situation? Well, collisions are extremely small scale. Okay, I mean, there, there is a viscosity in this fluid, but that's very, very, very uh, small scale. What happens here then is we, we, we will care about, let me just say it that way, a gravity force, uh, which is equal to the mass density times the uh, gravity G, or I can write that as minus rho mass gradient of this um, gravitational potential G. So what I want to do now is do a little bit of mathematics and show you how we find that this is an instability. Um, the idea is that we begin with the fluid equations that would be relevant for this case, which are mass conservation, d rho dt plus del dot rho mass v is equal to zero, uh, and the momentum balance equation, which is rho mass dv dt, is equal to the forces but in a fluid, ordinary neutral fluid, I won't have the usual Lorentz force, rho mass E plus V cross B, or well, rho mass v cross J cross B, but I will have potentially a pressure gradient, but I won't worry about that, it turns out. And then I'll have this gravitational force density, rho mass times the gravitational uh, constant G. But in fact, um, we will neglect the pressure here, uh, so what we're doing is neglecting sound waves, it turns out. But uh, I'll mention what they do as we kind of go along here. Now, just like in the wave analysis, okay, what we next want to do is linearize these equations and ask whether or not a small perturbation now, in our case, is going to grow or damp is the question. So what we want to do is linearize. And um, what we end up with then is d rho mass tilde uh, by dt plus, and now I'll have v dot grad rho mass naught. And then it turns out you work this all out. There's another term, rho mass divergence of V tilde. And that's all equals zero. And this equation, uh, when linearized, becomes rho mass naught uh, dV tilde by dt is equal to, um, oh, and I wrote it in the other form now, uh, minus rho mass tilde gradient of G. Now, 
it's customary in this business, you don't have to do it, to also assume that this is zero, uh, divergence of V, and assuming that zero basically means that I'm considering only incompressible oscillations. Uh, so, you know, most fluids are pretty incompressible, it turns out. So, uh, this says I can't compress them. Uh, so, I, well, don't have enough room to write in incompressible here. So we'll just only consider uh, incompressible oscillations. Yeah, the, the, it's consistent with the neglect of the grad P term to not put in that compressibility. If I did put that sound waves in, then I would need to put in the divergence V, correct? So it's consistent with, with neglecting that. But I, and since I'm not interested in that, I'll avoid it, so to speak. <laughs> it's just a little more algebra to include it. Okay, so if I now, uh, then the final step in our linearized transient analysis is we assume that the modes that might be in the plasma uh, have uh, e to uh, have, a, you know, like rho tilde goes like uh, e to the minus or e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. And so putting that in, my mass conservation equation then becomes minus I omega rho mass tilde. Um, actually, in linearizing, that should have become a partial derivative because the equilibrium flow should be zero and so forth. Uh, and then this will be plus, uh, let's just call it V tilde dot gradient rho mass naught is equal to zero. And the, that was the continuity equation, linearized. And the um, momentum equation becomes minus I omega rho mass naught uh, V tilde. And that's equal to minus uh, rho mass tilde grad G. So now I can um, solve the second equation for the V tilde and then stick it into the first equation. Okay. So what you find um, is that uh, V tilde is then equal to rho mass tilde over omega rho mass naught times the gradient of G. And then what you do is you um, substitute that into V. And so we'll do that. And what we then obtain uh, is, uh, well, sticking this in and sticking that on the other side. Well, I'll leave it that way. Minus I omega rho mass tilde and then plus uh, rho mass tilde over omega rho mass naught times gradient G dot gradient of the mass density. And now I've get, got myself a dispersion relation, as usual. Cancel out the common term. And, oh, now I see that I left out a critical I. And you need an I there. Um, and so I can, you know, I multiply these two together and I get, let's see, I squared omega squared. And so finally, putting this together, what we find is that we have a dispersion relation that omega squared is equal to minus... Uh, grad G dot gradient of the mass density. Um, and then there's a normalization also of the mass density in here. Now, if I had taken account of sound waves, it turns out they would give me minus K squared V sound squared. But we're not sort of mostly interested in that. We're mostly interested in this part. Okay, so now what I want to do is say, well, how would I get stability or instability out of this, out of this uh, fluid situation? Well, um, so let me move this guy up here. Um, so let's suppose that we had the heavy fluid on the bottom. 
Now, in that case, if I come back to my little sketch here of the, the fluids, then grad G is upward. Okay, this gravitational potential, grad G is upward. Then we would have grad rho mass would be, uh, let's see, oh, I'm sorry, it would be up, uh, yeah, sorry, it would be downward. So grad rho mass would be downward, okay, because of, I'd have the heavy mass on the bottom, light mass on the top. So I'd have grad rho mass, but then if I dotted that into grad G, uh, they would be in the opposite direction. So grad rho mass dot grad G would be less than zero. So if I now use that in this dispersion relation which we had, okay, uh, I'm not sure I can get all this on the same graph here, but so let's go back to this dispersion relation, ignoring now the sound waves, which puts a limit on the k values for which this can happen. Um, if I have this negative, then what this says is the omega squared would be greater than zero. And then we would just get omega is equal to plus or minus omega naught, you know, some oscillatory frequency. And physically, that's a stable situation. And what this analysis says if, is effectively that if I wiggle the interface between the heavy and light fluid, the heavy fluid if the heavy fluid's on the bottom, fine, it's all stable. Okay. On the other hand, suppose I put the light, the, the heavy fluid on the top. Well, then now my gradient rho mass is upward from bottom to up. I find that grad rho mass dot gradient G, they're aligned, so it's greater than zero. My omega squared becomes less than zero. And now what I have is that omega is equal to plus or minus i times omega naught. And I have two roots, but one of those roots is growing in time. So what happens is then I have an instability. And therefore, I have an, um, an unstable situation. And what really happens? Well, if we go back to here, what happens uh, on these little charts is that if I put the heavy fluid on the top, a little interface okay, develops here, and basically those things just permeate, those little fissures just permeate into each other, and you can even get into situations where they roll around and do all kinds of interesting things as the two fluids uh, interpermeate into each other. Um, by the way, in plasmas, there is a direct analogy of this in laser fusion. When you apply an um, electromagnetic wave that creates a pressure that tries to hold the edge of a, of a plasma, you see a Rayleigh-Taylor type instability right at the interface between the plasma pressure applied by the electromagnetic wave and the plasma, I'm sorry, the pressure applied by the, by the electromagnetic wave and the plasma. Okay, so, you know, you would say, well, no fool would put, you know, a heavy liquid on top of a light liquid and expect it to sit there, right? But in the early days of plasma physics, people didn't kind of realize the analogy of this, and it turns out the magnetic field, the mi a minimum or maximum in the magnetic field, provides the same basic type of mechanism. So that's what I want to uh, talk about next, is the relationship of this Rayleigh-Taylor instability to what happens in a plasma. So it turns out, and, and to do this upright takes a, a good bit of algebra, but we won't go through that. Uh, but in a magnetized plasma, it's as if we have an effective gravity. Um, so let's call it grad G effective, which is like 1 over B grad B. Or you could make it, you know, 1 over B squared grad B squared with a half here, I guess, if we wanted to do it that way. So what happens is the magnitude or strength of the magnetic field tends to take the place of the gravitational potential. So if we put the plasma in a minimum of the magnetic field, it's going to stay there. If we put, try to put it on a magnetic hill, it's going to fall off, uh, hence instability. What happens, and we'll go through a bit of this now,
what happens is the so-called Rayleigh-Taylor instability, which we've been talking about in a fluid, uh, goes over in a plasma to what's called an interchange instability. Uh, and that interchange instability is an interchange of magnetic field lines and flux uh, and, and pressure, just interchanges of units of pressure across magnetic field, I should say. Uh, so it's an interchange instability, and it's, in fact, very analogous. Um, now, to see all this, what we have to do is go into uh, think about uh, the various, um, well, uh, uh, the drift velocities in a plasma. So if you go back and remember that our drift velocity is, in fact, given by an E cross B, uh, drift velocity, then in addition, it's given by we had all these curvature and grad B drifts and stuff like that. And so this is B naught cross uh, mu grad B. And then there was the curvature, MV parallel squared uh, B dot del B. Uh, and then in addition, we wrote, and I won't worry about the uh, polarization type drift, the force on the gravitational, well, any ordinary force on the guiding center of the particles cross B over uh, QB squared. And so, and we had as our, we could have written our force on the guiding center was equal to minus mu grad B uh, plus MV parallel squared. Uh, I should say this is or that. Uh, and if I write it out as the force on the guiding center, it's minus mu grad B plus MV square law. I'm sorry, minus mv parallel squared of b dot del b. Um, now, suppose, on the other hand, that I had a gravity, a real gravity in a plasma. We usually neglect it. What it would it look like? Well, in terms of what we've been dealing with, it'd be minus m grad g. This would be the gravitational force. So I can use this to say, do these represent something like a gravity? That's the, the sense of what I'm going to be doing here. And in particular, these two, if you remember that this in the low beta plasma was 1 over B grad B, um, the sense of this is that then I can, in fact, write that the gravitational potential, first two terms give me minus M V parallel squared plus V perp squared over 2, and then 1 over B grad B, um, and then... Uh, this mass uh, M uh, grad G. So with that being the case, that's on a single particle basis, I then would kind of like to add all this up uh, for the entire set of particles in a plasma. And so let's uh, try to estimate the net force, and that would be the integral over all velocity space times some distribution function uh, times the force on the guiding centers. Uh, and you can see, if you go through this, that this would be minus. Now, if mv squared is just going to give me a take a velocity integral, that's the temperature, or the, I'm sorry, the pressure. So it would be minus p, it turns out, over b grad b. Uh, and this last term, the gravitational effect, the true gravitational effect, would just give me the mass density times the gradient of g. So the idea then is that I can see out of this that the effective gravitational potential, I'm going to write this one as grad G effective, okay? I'm actually minus rho mass naught uh, gradient G effective. So the effective gravitational potential would be like the pressure over the mass density times the gradient of B over B, which I could write as the gradient of log B. So, in other words, the inhomogeneity in the strength of the magnetic field, the density, magnetic flux density, to, um, you know, the not the vectorial direction, but the modulus of B, uh, is in fact has the same effect, okay, 
as if there was a gravitational force. So this is G effective then uh, for a magnetized plasma. And if we wanted to note it, this P over rho mass is, of course, the sound speed squared. Uh, maybe some other things I should note here is that the, the pressure is NETE plus NITI. It encompasses both, spe both species and the pressure over rho mass naught uh, is equal to V sound squared, plus or minus a factor of gamma, depending upon degrees of freedom and so forth. Anyway, so what I want to describe in a minute then is how actually we can look at various particular magnetic field configurations and see that, well, that it's like a Rayleigh-Taylor instability, that it's sort of like there's an effective gravity here. And the idea is that, um, you know, the gravitational potential is highest, uh, well, sorry, points from the Earth outward, let's say, whereas the gradient log B points from high, um, small regions of, B, regions of low B to regions of high B. And what we can see by this, it'll turn out that we want to put the plasma in a region of lowest magnetic field, hence what's called minimum B. And we'll do that in just a moment here.